Please join me in welcoming an outstanding educator, friend, and colleague by giving a warm Marshall University School of Pharmacy formally welcome to Dr. Joseph Shapiro. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. As Dean Brazo mentioned, we've had the chance to work together over many years, so I know what a great leader she is and so well in touch with pharmacy education around the country. And it's uh, my privilege to be here today as part of Pharmacy Month to provide this talk. It's not a speech, it's not a lecture. You know, I was thinking about uh, all the many times that I have to, the opportunities to speak with my students at Virginia Commonwealth University and think about the questions that they ask. And so I thought that might be the best thing to do today is, is focus on the kinds of questions that you may be asking as, as students. And I don't have all the answers, but we know what the questions are and maybe some perspective and thoughts about where pharmacy is heading, what the opportunities are for you in the profession. And I'm gonna ask that uh, each of you think of a question that you're hoping we will address over the next 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, I'd, be, I'd welcome these questions as we go along. If I do all the talking, this is gonna be not as interesting and a lot shorter than it would be if you'll help me and ask questions. And I welcome your comments. I may uh, particularly look to the faculty here for their comments and insights and, and our uh, alumni from, um, from their perspective on the issues that we'll be talking about. Wanted to say that it's a special privilege to be here at Marshall University and thinking about this, uh, I have the the privilege of being just two blocks down from John Marshall's house in Richmond, Virginia. So I'd like to welcome any of you who would like to come and visit us, come and visit me at the School of Pharmacy and uh, ha have a look at the Marshall house just two blocks away. So I've been in Virginia for five years now. It's really been uh, astounding to me and very interesting the history that we have, particularly related to pharmacy. And I recognize also that the history of Virginia is the history of West Virginia as well, since we were one state prior to the 1860s. You know, the first apothecaries who came to uh, the colonies back in the 1600s came to Jamestown in 1608, and this has been well documented, two apothecaries that came at that time. Also, uh, the first regulation or law related to pharmacy was from the from the uh, Virginia legislature back in the 1600s. So there's a lot of great history about uh, our traditions of pharmacy in this region. I, um, I think about pharmacy from the perspective of now almost 50 years. I began working in a pharmacy in 1971. I was 16 years old, so in a couple years it's gonna be 50 years, hard to believe but have, have always been connected with uh, pharmacy, not just pharmacy education, but over my career with academic medical centers, similar to this, where there are uh, medical schools and training centers and uh, have, have always um, uh, taken that, that perspective on it. I have to tell you that I've always been optimistic about our profession and I remain very optimistic. We're going through a, a time now of accentuated change and I think it's been disconcerting in some ways because we know that the years ahead are not gonna be like the years behind. There will be some similarities and th some trends and uh, the way things are not only in healthcare but in our profession that, ha that have been uh, present with us will carry on, but certainly it's going to be uh, a, a time of great change. I think there's some myths out there now in pharmacy that we deal with and contend with. Uh, I know that uh, many of us are, uh, 
are focused on the job situation in pharmacy, what the opportunities will be. And from my perspective, despite what I might hear from some directions, it, it is a myth that there are fewer jobs in pharmacy now. There are more jobs in pharmacy and opportunity than there ever have been. And this is something I'd like to talk a little bit more about. So one of the questions, if, and, and it's on a weekly basis that I have the opportunity to, to meet with our students, usually P4 students, but very often students in the other years as well. And we talk about a variety of, of different things, but a, a typical question that they'll ask, will pharmacists be needed in the future? Maybe some of you ask that same question as we uh, see the changes in the profession and, and consolidation, particularly in retail pharmacy, that these are certainly changes that are going on, but any one thing that you say about a profession is not true across the board, that there's so many, uh, so many other things happening. And I think there's a few ways that you can look at this question and again, I'm going to be interested in your perspectives, your thoughts, and it's okay to disagree with me if you have a different, different view of how things are happening. But I really believe that pharmacists are going to have an important role in healthcare for the foreseeable future, well past my career and well, well into the years that, that you are in the pharmacy profession. It's hard to imagine a time when pharmacists would not be important in healthcare. And this has to do with some of the important trends that have been going on for many years within healthcare. So I'd like to talk about some of the, the big picture big picture factors that lead me to conclude that pharmacists are going to have a place in healthcare, an important place for the years ahead. You know, if you look at the trends in um, the healthcare expenditure in this country, and, and look at that over, really over decades, that we continue to spend more and more each year on pharmaceuticals as each year goes by. And it used to be, it's not only the dollar amount that's increasing uh, each year, but if you look at the portion of the total national healthcare expense, it has risen over the last few decades, so it used to be a few decades ago, about 6% of the total healthcare expenditure that went to pharmaceuticals. Now it's north of 12%, and this is a trend that will continue to increase. Given the prevalence of chronic disease, the reliance of, uh, on medications as a major way to deal with chronic disease that's likely, and then you look at specialty medications that are exceedingly expensive, it's likely that we as a society, as a country, will be putting more of our valuable resource, money, into uh, not only healthcare but pharmaceuticals. So if, if uh, we were in a business where the expense and the resources were decreasing less and less, I might be a little bit more worried about that. And maybe you know of industries that uh, have disappeared or gone away because they've, they're no longer important or they're not getting the kind of attention or resources that uh, they did in the past. So significantly increasing expenditures on prescription drugs. Um, it's also very obvious to all of us that there's a lot of unmet need, particularly with chronic diseases. So many people who have diabetes, hypertension, are not getting good care. And this is with the best efforts of healthcare providers. There just isn't enough primary care providers to care for all those with chronic diseases. And so there's a huge unmet need. You, I'm sure you all know people who, uh, for various reasons, and maybe it's of their own doing, maybe it's la lack of access to uh, health care, but have have poor care, poor care for chronic diseases. 
So this is going on. And clearly, uh, you know, in the years ahead, we can expect that the chronic diseases that plague society will continue to be with us, whether it's diabetes or hypertension or asthma, dyslipidemias. And we are now uh, at the point, and have been for many years, where we rely on medicines to treat chronic diseases. Ideally, it would be a lifestyle issue that we could hopefully prevent a lot of chronic disease by uh, what people would do or what we, we could help them do in terms of smoking, not smoking, uh, losing weight, being more active in their lives, and clearly that's the most important thing. However, uh, we can expect that we will have to care for people who maybe even with uh, good lifestyle and maybe with not so good lifestyle but have chronic diseases that have to be managed. So this is becoming more and more prevalent in our society and uh, points to a greater need for what we do as pharmacists because of those, those two factors, the increasing prevalence of chronic diseases and the focus on medications as a major way to address chronic diseases. Aging of the population. As I, uh, as a baby boomer, enter close to the retirement years, it's clear to me that me and my generation will need a lot more help from uh, care providers, including pharmacists. We're likely to be on more medications than generations before us. And uh, not a final factor, but another important factor, we could probably add many things to this list, is that there are many problems with medicines. And if, if there were one factor uh, that I think deserves the most attention from us, and that is the unresolved problems related to medications. You all know these. If you talk to anyone in your family who's taking medications, pretty much everybody has some problem with medicines. Uh, we all know about the high expense and how much, how much focus now the expense of medications is getting and that we're seeing now and hearing about people who are not receiving proper care for the disease because of the expense factors, the high cost of some types of insulin. As a great example, there are stories all the time now about uh, people who are not getting proper care because of the expense of medications. And you can create a list even longer than this, medication errors, inappropriate drug use in a lot of ways, whether that's um, related to how we as health professionals use medications or how patients or people in society use medications, addiction, obviously, preventable adverse drug effects. Some people have said that our biggest problem with medications is poor adherence to therapy, that overall adherence may be in the range of 50% or lower for prescribed regimens. As I mentioned before, inadequate use of wellness measures. Uh, at this point in time, not so much a problem in the US, but counterfeit medications is a huge problem worldwide. And you hear more about this. I get the chance to travel from time to time to uh, places around the country, uh, sorry, around the world, and uh, hear about how much counterfeit medications are a problem. You know, there's a lot of discussion now about a method or an approach to reducing drug prices is to import medications. Well, it's a, a, a complex issue because in some ways we're already importing most of the medications, particularly generic medications, into this country. And it may be that uh, 75, 80 percent of medicines already come from China or India, and many of those are the high quality that we expect, but many of those are not. And so there are already uh, quality issues in our medication supply, and we should, as pharmacists, raise the issue and stay focused on the issue that if there were to be additional importation of drugs or importation of prescription medicines, can we and can our society assure that they are of the standard that we expect for uh, all of us. 
So adulterated and impure medications, on and on. This list could be uh, made even longer. Perhaps you can think of other problems with medicines that we can add to this list. This list of problems should be a significant assurance to all of you students in pharmacy that there's a need for you in the future. You know, if I could stand up here and say, we've solved all the problems with medicines. We'd turn off the lights, go home. They wouldn't need us. But I can't believe that we're going to resolve all these problems with medicines in the short next few years. You know, maybe many decades down the road, there's, uh, you know, we, we see headlines that advances in gene therapy have made medications obsolete. I can't imagine that that's going to happen anytime soon. Most likely not in your lifetimes or careers, even with advances in gene therapy that are likely to happen. But there could be other things that change the way healthcare is provided. But the point being that there are significant issues and problems with medicines. And the more that we're focused on these, these problems or issues or needs, the more relevant we're going to be in healthcare and the more assured we can be there, there will be a place for our pharmacists in healthcare. And as you begin your careers, I think it's very helpful and throughout your career to be focused on these problems or needs and think about how you can best address these problems, how you can be problem solvers to help resolve these, these issues that people are having with medications. So this is uh, something that I, I bring up a lot with our students. Uh, and again, um, the worst thing for longevity in a profession or in any type of business would be if there wasn't a need or the problems would be solved. But that's not likely to be our case for the years of head, ahead. So as you address the issues and, and problems that people have with medicines, uh, think about it as uh, some assurance that you're needed in healthcare. So another question that often comes to me from our students, again, the very general types of questions, what will be the roles for pharmacists in the future? And I'm not a good uh, fortune teller or a pr predictor of the future, but again, based on what is going on in the profession now, uh, there are things that we can, we can say about the future of pharmacy that are more, most likely to take place and opportunities or changes in the way that healthcare is delivered. You know, what changes do you expect in the future with the profession of pharmacy? And so there are some big dynamic changes that are already going on that you're, you're seeing, we're all seeing with the profession. And this has changed the opportunities for our profession. Clearly, we're seeing consolidation of traditional retail pharmacy. I don't believe for a second that retail pharmacy is going away. We're going to have community pharmacists for the years ahead, but it will be different. We should not have been surprised that, it would, that it's not uh, the most rational thing that we have a pharmacy on three corners of one intersection, you know, and this repeated over and over again around the country, or the, the buildup of pharmacies that occurred in the decade prior to this. This is really, uh, really unprecedented and quite different from what was the, the situation when I first got into the profession of pharmacy. Uh, Similar to situation now, the job situation was pretty tight. You know, there are no guarantees that. So this is this is 40 years ago that I graduated with my BS in pharmacy, but over that time I have the advantage of perspective of seeing the ups and downs of the profession and healthcare, and and can see various times over the years when the job situation has been tighter than others, when uh, changes have been occurring within the healthcare system. And such was the time when I graduated and people had to move around or uh, 
take a job that maybe their first job wasn't their ideal job, but things worked out. And so we are seeing consolidation in traditional retail pharmacy, uh, entry of other players into the market such as Amazon. I'm not sure what that means for the profession. I'm not overly worried about it because Amazon's going to need pharmacists. Now, if you're thinking, well, Amazon may be able to provide prescriptions a lot more efficiently than in current retail pharmacy, uh, there are examples of this already going on that have been with us for years, even before Amazon. If any of you are familiar with the federal system for filling prescriptions through uh, TRICARE, there's a, there are regional pharmacies. There was one that was near where I was uh, in Charleston, South Carolina for a while, North Charleston. I don't know what the acronym, I forget what the acronym stands for, CMOP facilities that would fill. Uh, hundreds of thousands of prescriptions in a day with uh, very few pharmacists, with maybe three, four, or five pharmacists working that day. So it's, you know, you think about how many, and through automation and uh, technicians, that um, this has been going on for a while. So if it's that Amazon may bring efficiencies into this system, then uh, that, that may happen, but these are, these are conditions that we've become adjusted to already. So I think that uh, this is going to continue. If you look back also at workforce studies in pharmacy that have been happening over the last 30 years or so, people predicted a long time ago that we would need fewer pharmacists to fill prescriptions. There, by some estimates now, uh, maybe about 150, 170 thousand pharmacists in the U.S. whose primary activity is filling prescriptions. Uh, there were some estimates back a few decades ago that we may only need 100,000 pharmacists just to fill prescriptions. So it says some things about just that segment of what pharmacists do and doesn't really say anything about all the other things that pharmacists do. In fact, this same workforce study that was done predicted that we would need hundreds of thousands more pharmacists to take care of patients, to uh, provide primary care, to work in managed care and industry. So it's this change that has been predicted for a long time that we're now seeing. Uh, and so uh, just some thoughts about areas that are expanding. Clearly health systems are expanding their pharmacy programs and pharmacy workforce. This has been going on for a long time. Most of the big health systems, I have met some of the people here from the health systems, but I don't have the data here, but I know from talking with our health system partners in Virginia that the big health systems have either doubled or tripled their staff, technicians and pharmacists, over the last 10 years. And this is a continuing trend. And so that has been a dramatic expansion of uh, pharmacist opportunities and roles. Ambulatory care, rapidly growing area. Uh, informatics, analytics, specialty care of ma many varieties. We have so many, so many more specialty pharmacists now than we did a number of years back, and this is continuing to expand. Just something last week, I'm uh, not up on the latest, but I think it was the Joint Commission that decided they were going to require that every hospital have an antibiotic stewardship program. Well, if you're going to have an antibiotic stewardship program, you have to have an antibiotic stewardship pharmacist. So there's still a lot of hospitals that don't have these programs, and it's an example of the kind of thing that's happening that's going to expand opportunities in this area. Pharmacists involved, involved in wellness services, a variety of types. Uh, maybe you all know pharmacists who are also certified diabetes educators. And as I've come to learn, it's not an area that I've worked in. Um, my wife, who's a pharmacist, happens to also be a CDE, so I know that sh she has spent most of her time in that role counseling patients about diet and exercise, even far and away above the time she spends in adjusting their medications. So it's focused on uh, wellness. And managed care. So with this, uh, 
of our three children, one of them is a pharmacist. And from day one, getting into pharmacy school, he graduated a few years ago, he was never interested in the clinical part of pharmacy. So I didn't really give him a hard time about that, but um, that was, uh, his interest was in business. And from day one, so he got into pharmacy school, spent, uh, well, uh, also got into the MBA program, so graduated with a PharmD and MBA, and he's in managed care now. So he tells me what he's doing uh, in informatics and analytics and policy, and that they're hiring all these pharmacists to, to do this and, and really manage uh, health systems. They, they help uh, health systems and community pharmacies meet quality measures. And so just another example of something that has opened up uh, and will continue to be an emphasis area for the future. So it's really uh, a, a point where we're, we see this mixed picture of great opportunity while traditional pharmacy is changing in this way. And so this has left some people uh, in, in a difficult situation. If you're a pharmacist that graduated 20, 30, 40 years ago, certainly people in my era and even after that, and um, were, were focused on filling prescriptions and not uh, able to or did, didn't take advantage of um, enhancing careers and learning new things that I think some of these individuals are having a tough time right now. If stores close and not having the opportunity to, uh, to move to other areas of the country. So we're seeing this mixed picture of what's going on in the profession. One thing that you should do if you haven't done already is do a Google search on pharmacy jobs. And so I do it from time to time and really kind of amazed at what's out there. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but it just, just a, a, an amazing mix of job titles that you find. Specialty pharmacist navigator. I, you know, back when I graduated, it was community pharmacist or hospital pharmacist. That was the, and then administrative pharmacist. Uh, maybe some who went to industry, but the span now of opportunities that will be open to you as pharmacy graduates is really, really amazing. But it's hard to characterize. So what? Uh, you know, it's not one direction. Sometimes people ask me, well, what direction is pharmacy going? And that's in line with the question that, that I asked, what are the roles for pharmacists in the future? There's not one direction. You know, it's a bunch of different directions. And so that can lead you to think about, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, things that you can do to best prepare for the years that lie ahead, given that pharmacy is going from the basis of being a pharmacist into different directions. It's another slide of list of um, pharmacist titles that are out there. And if you were to do the same today, I think you'd, you'd find a similar list of just a variety of different things, even in health systems now. So I've asked our health system directors to give me a list of the various titles of pharmacists that they have in their health system. And so it's not only uh, pharmacist manager, staff pharmacist, uh, IV room pharmacist, and, and many other things. So the antibiotic stewardship pharmacist, the IT pharmacist, but also uh, titles like 340B pharmacist, supply chain pharmacist. I mean, on and on, it's just the specialty drug pharmacist. And all of these require some additional knowledge. And so it's something to be thinking about as you graduate from pharmacy school, while all these opportunities are out there, there has to be a good bridge for you to get from graduating to be qualified for these kinds of positions. And that's um, a more difficult question to answer. Well, how do you get there? How do you do that? And so there are a number of different pathways to getting there. For some of those positions, it is a residency. Again, it's another common question that I get from my students. Should I do a residency? There's no one answer. Tell me about what you're interested in doing. What's your ideal kind of job once you get out? And depending on the answer to that question, 
I might say, you know, if you say, I really want to be an oncology clinical specialist, I want to be an infectious disease clinical specialist, then, okay, well then it's easy. There's a clear path. You need to do a PGY1 and then a specialty residency in that area, and then you'll be competitive for those kinds of jobs. There are a lot of other jobs, some that uh, listed here and in the previous slide, that the path isn't as clear. And it may not be that you need to do a residency. Uh, it may be some that uh, have been and will continue to be on the job training. It may be some that it's a master's program, an MBA, or some other a master's of public health, some other degree, or certificate training that will put you in a good position for those kinds of jobs. So it's important to think about all these different directions and uh, I know that it can be confusing, overwhelming, particularly those of you students, P1, P2, P3 years. But as you get to know more uh, about yourselves, your own interests, then you can narrow your interests and make choices among these different career paths. So I've, you know, I've come to think about now, um, being a pharmacist is a great foundation for all the other types of career opportunities that are out there. And yes, I would expect that some of my students, our graduates, and some of you will, pr will practice in traditional pharmacy because that's still needed there. But many more of you will go into other areas and go through, so go through this door into uh, these many different types of opportunities that are there as pharmacists. So, so these are critical questions, you know, about residencies, master's programs, fellowships, and uh, again, it's not a s simple answer. I, it's, I don't know what I could tell you that would apply to all of you as students, but a one-on-one -on -one conversation to learn more about what you're interested in, what drives you, how you see your careers, would then help me to understand better where you're headed and provide advice. But I know you're getting good advice from your dean and your faculty members about these career options and uh, what's open to you. And another way to look at this, that uh, I think there are some really interesting opportunities at the interfaces of our profession and other professions. In the case I mentioned, uh, my son Tom, who went on to get his MBA. So he's got a foot in both worlds, in the pharmacy world and in the business world. He needs to understand uh, advanced kinds of business approaches to be able to do what he does. And we, we know people who are, uh, I mean, other examples that have, that have crossed some of these boundaries, pharmacists, lawyers mentioned before, information technology. Somebody who's uh, a pharmacist and adept at either uh, databases, information technology, analytics, really has a lot of opportunity now because they're so, so in demand. Every health system, every major corporation involved in pharmacy has to have people who are very knowledgeable about uh, data management and information technology. Public health, we have a lot of pharmacists who are in the public health world. Maybe they got a master's of public health or obtained uh, s skills and knowledge in other ways. Um, I know some pharmacists who are the, 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 the public health people for their s individual states and in dealing with things like uh, uh, crisis management and uh, drug supplies and other key public health issues. So again, it's another way to think about the opportunities that you'll have in the future is building on that degree. You notice there's a big area in the middle that you don't, you don't have to do one of these things because most of you will practice at, as pharmacists in the way that we would expect, but many of you will have these other opportunities in, in inter, at interfaces of these other professions. I'm gonna stop here for a minute. I've been talking too long, I intended to uh, uh, 
ask for questions and comments, and so I'm happy to be redirected. If there's something that at the beginning you thought there was a question that you'd like to hear us address, would you be brave enough to raise a hand and give a question? One right here, then in back. Uh, you mentioned that counterfeit drugs are becoming a big issue worldwide. Um, do you think that spread is on the rise to here in the United States? And if so, how? Yeah, it's um, so for all those yeah who did not hear uh, as much of a problem as I think counterfeit medications or adulterated medications, or, you know, where their quality problems have been a problem around the world. Is it on the rise in the U.S.? I think it is. Uh, you know, we just had um, an example just this morning, and it's been in the news for a while, is ranitidine tainted with NDMA. Uh, I have a feeling that if we were to re uh, meticulously analyze other drug products that we have coming from other countries, we'd find this is like the tip of the iceberg. So this is a huge concern, and uh, I, I think that, you know, of, of all the things that society is concerned with, one of the most is quality of medicines and and um, it's something that we we could do a lot more with and I suspect that here in this country as we open up uh, importation more so than it has been that there will be bigger issues with the quality of medicines and that's that's a place where we sh we should be just figuring that out thank you there's a question in back Yes, so uh, maybe for those who didn't hear, those who are thinking about a residency, what's the best way to prepare to um, set yourselves apart? Uh, Trying to think of a way to answer that in the, the less than the usual hour that I might talk with students about it. So a few things, one would be as you go along in your pharmacy program, Learn as much as you can about these opportunities like residencies. You may decide upon learning all that you can that it's not the best option for you, but it's great to make that decision based on being fully informed. So talk to as many people as you can. Learn about residency programs, what they can achieve for you, what they may not be able to achieve. Talk to people. If you see someone who's in you say, this is the ideal position. I would really like to graduate and get a job like this person has. Ask them, how did they get there? And if you're hearing the answer was a residency path and that person feels like that was essential to their success, that will tell you a lot. As opposed to someone who says, well, I, I got here you know, in a different way and I didn't need to do a residency. Well, that'll tell you a lot as well. So. Uh, Talking with people, asking a lot of questions is really going to be a key. There's a lot that when you make the decision, if you make a decision to go to residencies that you can do to prepare yourselves. Uh, we were talking about this last night at the Dean's House that now um, so much of it comes down to the interview and letters of reference, preparing for the interview process so that you know not the exact questions are going to be answered, but you, you know how to uh, deal with interview questions and present yourself, how to tell your story is really critical. Um, getting good letters of recommendation, it's really surprising to me how many poor letters of recommendation get written. So when you uh, ask for someone to write a letter for you, be sure that there's some, it's someone who knows you well and you can say that whatever that interaction was with that person, it was a good interaction, so they have a lot of good things to say. Uh, and so you'll have strong letters of recommendation. It's not so much dependent on GPA. I hear this all the time. You know, residency programs are not looking for 4 0 students. They realize that students with lesser GPAs are going to be uh, sometimes the better residency residents, so that's important as well. There's a lot more to talk about and, and be able to say a few things as we go on here in the next few minutes. In fact, uh, what I was going to 
kind of finish up on <clears throat> with some thoughts about, again, the question that I hear all the time this week, talking with my students for just, just about any week that I could think about, the question would come up, how can I best prepare for my career in pharmacy? and overlap somewhat with the question about how to prepare for residency programs. And you put this with all that's going on in healthcare and in the pharmacy world, and I, th I think it comes down to uh, focusing on what you can control, because there's so much that's out of our control, but you can put yourselves in the best position by thinking about things, uh, as I mentioned, being informed. So being ill-informed is going to put you at a disadvantage. So, so being informed about where the profession is going, where healthcare is going, what the opportunities are, talking with people. So this connects also with this networking. What is networking? It's shaking hands, it's asking people questions, it's introducing yourself, it's asking a practitioner, what do, you, what do you like about your job? How did you get there? Uh, are there more opportunities to do what you're doing? So this is an important thing. Um, understanding the healthcare system. You know, we're all trying to figure out how pharmacists can be properly, adequately reimbursed for their services. And there's such a mix of examples out there now from um, those who have good models, if you, could, if you can imagine any type of advanced or progressive practice of pharmacy, it's going on now. Our big problem is it's not consistent across the board. And there are examples where it's happening and not happening. So we've got to figure that out and understand these health systems better that we're working within. Building personal networks, finding mentors, when I, uh, I often ask employers, and it could be health system or the chains, uh, what is it you're looking for in a graduate? And I, I keep asking the question because I, you know, every now and then I'm expecting to hear something a little bit different, but it's been very consistent over a number of years. And, you know, they're not telling me, there's no disrespect to the med chemists, that we wish they knew more med chemistry or we wish they knew more pharmacology. Uh, as important as that is, and I believe in the value of our pharmaceutical sciences, but they're saying they want people who are good communicators, leaders, they want flexibility because they know their jobs are going to be different as time goes on. People who work well in teams, this adaptability. This is what, what I'm hearing. You, you could ask the same questions. So the, we have employers here today, you had the career fair this morning. Maybe some of you had the opportunity to ask uh, the employers, what are you looking for? What kind of qualities? And to hear, uh, hear from them, maybe it's a, a little bit different. And so thinking about, again, the issue, how can you put your best, your, yourselves in the best position these qualities that hold up in challenging times, that no matter what happens with health care, these are important characteristics, important qualities. Being a critical thinker and problem solver, every aspect of our industry is going to have problems that need to be solved. Are you among those who can solve some of these problems? Being an innovator, being, being professional, leadership, being a good communicator, again, qualities that if you develop in your career will pay off in the years ahead. And so uh, I think to finish up, a key thing as you go through your program is to have a certain amount of uh, self-reflection about what's important to you and that can guide you in the direction of these opportunities. If your driving passion is face-to-face -face care with patients, great, how much of that we, we need, but that'll help you to decide and contrast. As an example, you know, I mentioned my son, that wasn't really his thing. He really liked the business and the analytics and the data and all of that, his driving passion. So it helped him decide on uh, his career direction but the, the more you know about what's important to you in your career, the better we, your, your faculty, your dean, can give you advice about the directions you're, you're heading in. 
As I mentioned, speak with people who have experience. It just, uh, you're going to hear a lot of different things, and you don't have to accept all the advice that you get. But I think that talking with a lot of people, getting advice, it, it does make sense. I don't think it leads one to greater uh, uncertainty and confusion. I think it can help you as you, you go on in your career. And lastly, uh, as much as you can, give yourself options, be flexible. And one example is in geography. The more you can open up your geography, the more opportunities you're going to have in the job world. Uh, and, and I know um, we have graduates as well that uh, maybe for family reasons, other reasons, spousal reasons, they have got to stay in Richmond. There's just not a choice. Okay, well, that's understandable and we make the most of that. But if you have the opportunity and can go to other places, maybe it's a job, maybe it's a residency, I think a lot of what we're experiencing now in the pharmacy workforce is more of a maldistribution of jobs. I'm told by the uh, major chains that there are still many areas of the country that need pharmacists. They have trouble recruiting pharmacists to. But it's not necessarily, so in my area, Richmond or around the D.C. area or some of the big, big cities, but a lot of areas that are uh, great places to live that need pharmacists. So the more, again, the more that you can open up your, your thinking about where you would go, where you would live, the more opportunities that you're going to have. I, I know we want to leave uh, some time for other questions, so I'm going to stop here. It's really been a privilege for me to be here today and talk with you during Pharmacist Month. I, uh, again, from all the years that I've been a pharmacy, I know that for many of us, our, cro our paths will cross again. And maybe you'll find yourselves in Virginia or, or we'll meet at a uh, national meeting or some other event. So I look forward to that. So I, I think it's probably an appropriate time to stop and see if there are questions. I would invite any comments or perspective from any of you as well. So uh, how many times have I moved to be flexible? Yeah, uh, well, I was fortunate uh, when I first started out, I worked for the University of Georgia. And I can see now that um, it gave me a lot of flexibility. I would have moved, I stayed there for 24 years. I would have moved a lot sooner to another job if there wasn't a lot of flexibility in the job. So one thing to think about is even if it's not the ideal job, if you get into a good organization, you have a lot of opportunity for uh, flexibility, mobility, moving up or doing some different things in a good or Now, I'm thinking about, you know, could be the chain pharmacy organization, could be a hospital system or an industry or a university. There are a range of um, quality in those places from some that are really good to work for, work within, and some that aren't. So uh, in my situation, there were some major changes of direction that I was able to make while still working for the University of Georgia. If it had not have been, I know I would have been somewhere else. Um, but I made two moves in my career. So after 24 years, then I left to become dean at, uh, in South Carolina, Medical University of South Carolina and University of South Carolina. And it was a, um, uh, something that was attractive to me at the time that was not attractive a few years before that. I never set out to be a dean. And one thing that I, I realize and see in a lot of other people is you, you look at it differently as time goes on. And uh, there were things that I wanted to do that I couldn't do there at the University of Georgia um, and made one move after being there nine years. So I don't move often, twice in you know, 35 years, and then move to Richmond, Virginia. And it's a long story about what was going on in South Carolina, a very co complex political situation there with the schools of pharmacy that um, prompted me to look at other opportunities. Thanks. One or, one or two additional questions?
Thank you all.